Pois. Uh, it might, we just got that meeting is being recorded message. Looks like they might be getting ready to get started. I don't know. Unless that's just Joe taking care of business. Hey, Will. John, you look like you're peeking out from underneath that light. What work do you do underneath that light? It seems pretty intense. Well, I, uh, my eyes are not as good as they once were. So <laughs> I find that I, even with a computer, I need some extra light. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm with you, John. <laughs> That's great. Have either one of you heard of Gibbs Gardens before in Georgia? Of what gardens? Gibbs, G-I-B-B-S. No, where are they? Uh, north of Atlanta, about an hour north of Atlanta, maybe a little west. Um, we spent, I wish we could have spent more time there, but we spent about a, half, a little bit better than half a day only seeing half of it and it just was absolutely breathtaking it's on our list to go back um in the springtime there's different themed gardens there was literally fields of wildflowers like a wildflower meadow just it was just gorgeous um monarch butterflies apparently migrate through there so there was so many butterflies wow um, it just was the neatest thing and yeah. we didn't even get to see the formal manor gardens um there was even more i mean it's just it's the kind of place that if i lived up there i would go to all the time <laughs> you know talking about the monarch butterfly there was a documentary I think it was on Netflix about the monarch butterfly. I didn't know that they had such a migration process. They go from mm -hmm. Mexico up uh, to Michigan, down through the South and back to Mexico. It takes three years, several generations. Mm -hmm. It's interesting now, the later generations know where to go. Yeah, yeah, and apparently they're um dwindling in numbers there which is crazy to like you just take monarch butterflies for granted um Bye. but their 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 numbers are much much less than what they used to be um we need to collectively take better care of this world true Well, I'll bet you today's speaker is going to generate some lively discussion. You think? Oh, here comes Ike. Good seeing you guys. Talk to you later. Well, maybe we got a few more minutes. Maybe. Uh, Gigi, there was another garden uh, called Callaway Gardens. I don't know whether it's still going or not, but its big deal was Christmas. They decorated the hotel with a jillion Christmas trees. And people used wow. to, to, to book the hotel just to go see that stuff. Now, the grounds are gardens. So, I mean, not like what you're talking about, but a little different thing. Uh, that's also where the FSU circus used to uh, winter or practice or whatever you... Uh, I haven't looked that up in a while. You might look that up if you're interested. In that kind of thing. That's, I think they're that's still here in Florida. It's in it's, Alabama. It's close to Alabama. It's it's a hike. Hmm. Well, I've got a 
mother-in-law in Alabama that I'm hoping um, she's she's said it before. So it's one of those I'll believe it when everything is signed on the dotted line. Um, but she's supposed to be meeting with a realtor coming up this weekend and putting her house up on the market and moving to Jacksonville. Um, we're very excited about that. But that also means some trips out to Birmingham to help her um, you know, prepare, get ready, whatever whatever she needs to be able to, uh, to move here. So maybe we make that part of the trip if we're going out that far anyway. I'm going to look that up. Well, you might look it up. It's a neat place. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, John. It's in Pine Mountain, Georgia. I was just Ooh. looking it up. Oh my. Pine Mountain. Hmm. Where I grew up in New Jersey, there was a little area called Pine Mountain. Oh. Southwest Georgia. Could clearly be on the way to Birmingham. I believe it is. Oh. Okay, they're fussing with the mic. Well, it was lovely to talk to you guys. Continue to do well. Have a great week. If uh, same to you guys. I got, a feeling I got a feeling we're about to get cut off. I think so. All right. Well, you all take care. Bye bye.
Welcome to the Rotary Club meeting, October 27th. We're co-hosted this week, Rotary Club of West Jacksonville and the Riverside Club co-hosting this meeting together. So appreciate everyone being with us. And our invocation will be given by Ken Baker, followed by the pledge led by Frank Shea. Shai. Thanks, Ike. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us this day and every day. We thank you for Rotary and the wonderful way it allows us to serve our local community and our world community. Um, thank you for this special Rotary Day where we get to fellowship with our, our good friends and neighbors from Riverside Club. In your name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in the Pledge of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And so it begins. Some uh, general, house general housekeeping. Um, I am I am wearing my school colors today. I'm a graduate of Troy University. I'm not a bulldog. So don't sleep on Troy. That's what they keep kept telling me. Don't sleep on Troy. Um, I think because I slept through a lot of classes, but maybe that's not the point. Don't sleep on Troy. Uh, really want to welcome our, our guest today, the co-host in the meeting with us, Riverside Club. Really happy that you joined us today. This is always a fun event and a fun day. Um, a little bit more housekeeping. You probably can't see this, but somebody left your glasses at the sign-in table. You can just get with me after the... Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. Uh, the big red bus is outside uh, right now. So uh, seldom do we get a chance to save a life. Go out and donate blood. We'll excuse from the meeting to go out and donate blood. Uh, already brave the line out there this morning so very special program next week past rotary president past rotary international president john germ current trustee he is going to be presenting to us via zoom he'll be the program uh, very few times in our rotary careers can we hear a past rotary international president current trustee presenting to a club so everyone Please uh, zoom in next week or join us live. One other announcement. There are 14,859 streets in Duval County and our own Marshall Butler has already run over 5,000 of them. So we, uh, we cheer him in on in his quest to run every street in Duval County and um, a toast to Marshall. A toast to the guy that needs to stay hydrated. So congratulations, Marshall. Uh, family of Rotary, Bob Hyde. A short report this week. Uh, three uh, Westside Rotary birthdays to report today. Past president, Dr. Dan Dodd today. Happy birthday, Dan. Tomorrow, the 28th, Rodney Butler. And on Sunday, Halloween, Jackie Culver. Those are our birthdays. As mentioned last week, please keep the Chapman family uh, in your thoughts uh, and prayers. Uh, just a quick note of, about uh, former RI President John Germ. Many of you remember that uh, through the great work and contacts of past District Governor Marshall and uh, uh, incoming President Sean, uh, John Germ uh, spoke to us at the 50th anniversary celebration of this club. So um, it's, it's doubly good to have him coming to talk to us again. Um, uh, final item, the, uh, this week's uh, Marty Sack Memorial Joke. Uh, these are wonderful church bulletins. Thank God for the church ladies with typewriters. These sentences actually appeared 
in church bulletins or were announced at church services. First, the sermon this morning, Jesus walks on water. The sermon tonight, searching for Jesus. <laughs> Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. Next Thursday, there will be trials for the choir. They need all the help they can get. <laughs> the ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. They may be seen in the basement on Friday afternoon. <laughs> and a couple of final ones. The low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. at the First Presbyterian Church. Please use the large double door at the side entrance. <laughs> this concludes my report. At this time, I would like to uh, ask Ken Baker and John Sims to come to the podium for a special uh, presentation. Hey, John. I'm um, happy to announce that John has earned his blue badge. He uh, no longer is a rookie Rotarian, and uh, I'm pleased to give it to him today. Uh, if you haven't met John, I'm sure you probably have. He's, he's been here just about every meeting and always out greeting people. So uh, welcome, John Sims. Thank you. Rahul Sharma will give our Surgeon of Arms report, and then William Milney will introduce our program. Thank you very much, President Ike. Rotary just got stronger today with John Sims' induction into our club. John, congratulations. How about another big round of applause for John Sims? Bringing in new members is uh, the lifeblood of our program, so we really appreciate our membership team for continuously emphasizing the importance of the future of Rotary. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm very uh, privileged to be able to introduce our uh, re visiting Rotarians, members and guests. And I have to say, you know, we're so also privileged to be able to have great guest speakers throughout the year. And uh, I have to admit, being a Jacksonville guy, uh, nothing uh, brings people together uh, than football in the South. And you can see this unified force that we have here today between Riverside Rotary and West Jacks Rotary. Give yourselves a big round of applause for that. Why, what a list of uh, Rotarians that we have visiting from the Riverside Rotary today. Kevin Cusell, Colonel Joe Miller, John Kagan, Bill Lewis, uh, Casey Bulgin. Uh, it's amazing. You know, you look at, uh, you got uh, Tony Osteen, Drew Story, Bob Kidd, Alan Eubanks, Bill Hallows. Welcome uh, to today's meeting, and we're glad to have you. Round of applause. Kevin Cazell, you had a, a guest that you wanted to introduce, uh, especially uh, for the occasion for today's meeting. I wanted to have, give you that opportunity to do so. Kevin? Thank you, sir. I'd like to uh, introduce Paula Wynn, who's a guest of mine uh, for our rotary at, at Riverside Rotary. Hopefully, she will join. And also, I've got former councilman, city councilman, John Draper here with us. And, and John is also a Navy veteran. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. John, thank you for your service. Paula, great to have you here. Please keep Rotary in mind for your future. Judge Del Wallace, we're so glad to have you back, sir. Back where you belong here at West Jacks Rotary. And you have a guest here today, Judge. I do. I'm happy to have my guest here today, Tom Snyder. Uh, he's my, uh, my brother-in-law, married my uh, na sister Nancy. And Nancy and Tom lived in Orlando and most recently <coughs> Indianapolis. But Tom's a longtime Rotarian. He comes to us from the, uh, uh, the Rotary Club of Indianapolis. He is an executive with the ATO Foundation, which is the national headquarters of ATO fraternity. And Tom's in the foundation development part of ato but anyway he's they moved to jacksonville and they're looking for a rotary home in riversiders you know not for you guys okay let's hope let's, but that's uh, <laughs> yeah but uh, anyway we're, we're glad to have tom down here and he's a really black rib solid rotarian so i hope we can welcome him here thanks very much wonderful welcome tom what an introduction 
I figured I'd go ahead and set the mood for today's main event. I know many of you want to hear from Rick Catlett, and we'll get to him in just a moment. But I figured every single week, the Rotary West Club of Jacksonville puts such high expectations on me to tell jokes. And so I figured today, not only am I going to tell jokes, I'm going to bring some energy, and it's going to be centered around the theme of football. So here are the top five football jokes of the day. Number one, why was the tiny ghost asked to join the football team? They needed a little team spirit. Number two, why are centipedes not allowed to play football? You know, it, it takes a little bit too long to put the cleats on them. There are a lot of feet on a centipede, so that's why they're not allowed to play football. Number three, what happens to football players when they go blind? They become referees. They become referees. Which football player wears the biggest helmet? Which football player wears the biggest helmet? Well, of course, the one with the biggest head, and that would be me. And number five, why are college football stadiums always so cool? Because they're full of fans. And thank God we have gotten to this point in our country that we can bring fans into stadiums and pack the place because college football is meant to have fans. And guys, give a big round of applause for bringing fans back together. Post-pandemic, and here we are in this situation, and we're bringing fans back together, Georgia versus Florida. We're setting the mood. We're setting the tone. Dogs, gators. Before we get to Rick Catlett, here's William Milne to introduce our guest speaker. William. Fellow Rotarians, before I introduce my good friend Rick Catlett, will Ed Lombard, will you give us an update on the football pool? All right, congratulations. Well, fellow Rotarians, we are so fortunate to have Mr. Rick Catlett with us here today. Rick has been such a force in Jacksonville's growth and development for high-level sports. From December 1992 to December 2020, Rick served as the Chief Executive Officer of the Gator Bowl Association. His primary responsibility was to oversee all aspects of the Gator Bowl game, which recently celebrated its 75th anniversary in December of 2019 with a win from the Tennessee Volunteers over the Indiana Hoosiers. I'm sure many of you were there. During Rick's tenure, the association broadened its scope to include numerous neutral site college football games, the Florida Florida State baseball game, and the ACC championship football game for three years. Another big highlight was the Gator Bowl with Rick's influence also served host to Bobby Bowden's final game in January of 2010. Prior to the Gator Bowl Association, Rick served as a senior administrative aide to two mayors over a 12 year period and was the administration's point person in Jacksonville's pursuit to win an NFL franchise. He has also served on numerous boards and commissions in a volunteer capacity during his career, including Rotary of Downtown Jacksonville. Catlett is married to Carol Catlett, who retired from the Duval County School System after 35 years of excellent teaching. He has two children and four grandchildren. Here to talk with us about Florida, Georgia. Please join me in welcoming Jacksonville's finest sports authority and my good friend, Rick Catlett. Thank you. How do you give a talk about Georgia, Florida? Well, I thought I'd open up by kind of giving you an idea of uh, my relationship with that game uh, and uh, that stadium over there. Um, I was born in Athens, Georgia. My father played football at Georgia. We moved down here when I was two years old. After being here about six or seven years in Florida, kept winning the game, and I kept watching my parents and all their friends be really, really sad, I announced I was going to be a Florida Gator. And then it was time to go to college, and I went to Florida State. <laughs> so I figured something out while I was at Florida State majoring in government. If you were born in Athens and you can cover all the Bulldogs in town, and if you went to Florida State, you can cover all the Seminoles in town, and you're a diehard Gator, you probably ought to go into politics. So that's how I got into politics. Um, it's funny, but if you go back uh, in the early days, um, my father was the president of the Georgia Bulldog Club here uh, for a couple of, couple of uh, terms. And uh, I used to have to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning and go down to the old Robert Meyer Hotel and listen to 2,000 bulldog fans drinking Bloody Marys and screwdrivers and barking at the moon. 
Now I missed all the Gator stuff because dead would never go until Dick Stratton. And many of you may remember Dick Stratton came along. Dick Stratton was the founder of the coaches, um, show, whoops, show the next day after the, after the games on Saturday night. So he took me down to Gainesville and I got to watch the show and all that kind of stuff, but I never got to go to any Gator tailgate parties, obviously during that whole period of time. So in 1983, the mayor put me in charge of sports development for Jacksonville, and I got to start my own tailgate party with the people that worked down there. And we would start on Friday afternoon about 4.30, and we would finish on Sunday morning about 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. Amazing how many fifths of Jack Daniels people could get into that stadium back in those days. I still call it the world's co largest outdoor cocktail party. I call it the Georgia Florida game every year. I know the city rotates it. I call it the Georgia Florida game because my father, obviously, in respect for him, uh, be, having played football and gone to Georgia, uh, you'll always hear me call it the Georgia Florida game. We had a great run for a lot of years at that old stadium. I will tell you that we would have lost the game had we not gotten the Jaguars. What we did in 83 with the renovation of the stadium was not enough. Why come here when Atlanta's building brand new stadiums and they can make just as much money in Atlanta as they can here. So the city fathers achieving uh, the Jaguars to come here, rebuilt the stadium and that stadium has served this game better than any others. And the most important part of having the new stadium was instead of having the Georgia fans in this quarter and the Florida fans in this quarter and the quarter and a quarter. And when the game was over, everybody came out together. So you'd have Florida people coming down this ramp and Georgia people coming down this ramp. And guess what happened when they got to the bottom? We used to arrest a lot of people. <laughs> so we went to halves when we divided the stadium in half. And you could wake up in the fourth quarter after being a little intoxicated and missing the second quarter and the third quarter. And you wouldn't have to ask anybody who's leading the game now because all you have to do is see which fans were left. And a lot of them leave. Um, we have. Uh, only one issue with the game right now. The only issue that we have is that if the SEC, now that they've expanded and gone to 16 teams, ever goes to a nine conference schedule. In other words, if right now they play eight conference games and then the other games, if they ever go to nine games, that will prohibit them from having a neutral site game here. I know a lot of people have heard um, the coach at Georgia talk about, it's just not fair, it's a, it's a Jacksonville deal. Well, somebody tell Vince Dooley that because he went 17, seven and one in the stadium. So I'm not so sure it was a home team for Florida back in those days, but maybe it is now who knows it might have something to do with Steve Spurrier and, and uh, our new coach at the Jaguars is the reason they're saying it's a home home game for, for that. Uh, the, he, he's also brought up the fact that uh, he doesn't get to bring recruits to the game. It's an away game for them. That's not true. And I like uh, the statement we made earlier about bringing fans into the stadium and getting back together. Another one of Fauci's, you know, what's uh, when he talked about the uh, uh, super spreader. Well, he also, what you don't realize is every year there is a home team for that game. And that's why the city flip flops it. It's Florida's home game one year. It's Georgia's home game the next year. Under NCAA guidelines, you can bring recruits as long as you're the home team. So he can do that if he wants to. Uh, it's just a decision that the University of Georgia has made over the years. Got ready to retire. I found out I had some health issues, so I got ready to retire and, and I looked around the athletic community and said, okay, who do I want to take my place? And needless to say, I don't get to make that decision. The board of directors does, but I wanted to identify two or three people that would be competent and capable of, of taking my place. One of my really, really good friends who kind of lived the kind of life I did, um, he went to Georgia, played tennis at Georgia, worked for Vince Dooley left there, went to the University of Florida for 18 years under Jeremy Foley, went back to Georgia as the athletic director, and he'd been the athletic director at that time for about eight years. And I went to Greg McGarity and I said, Greg, what are you going to do um, when you retire? And he said, well, I'm thinking about retiring on my 10th anniversary, and, and, and then I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. And I said, well, you know, your son works for me. And he said, he does. And I said, why don't you come down and take my place? Um, I knew I had to stepped down in about two years. So um, we talked for a long, long time. And once I really did have to retire um, after COVID, then Greg had just retired from the University of Georgia. So we, we were able to 
bring Greg down here to be the president and CEO of the Gator Bowl, which is probably the greatest thing we could have ever done over the next few years because we're going to have a playoff system, an expanded playoff system. And if we're going to have any chance of getting into that system, we need two things to happen. We need somebody that knows what's going on on the inside of college football, and Greg certainly will know that, and we need a new stadium. And I know that a lot of you are going, new stadium, why do we need a new stadium? It's 25, 27 years old. Guys, it is one of the worst revenue producers in the National Football League. And the only way you move into those big kinds of games, like a national championship game, is to have a premium revenue stadium. And so over the next four or five years, you're going to hear a lot of talk about building a new stadium. There's so many football games, neutral site games that we can have if we have something like they have in Atlanta. Wouldn't you have liked to have just taken the old Atlanta, Georgia Dome and moved it down here because it was such a great stadium? And then they built Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and now it's head and shoulders above anything we have in the country. So that's kind of uh, where we are from a logistical standpoint with the game. We have a five-year contract. Uh, the five-year contract, they're not going anywhere. If anybody ever hears, you ever hear anybody from the two schools say, we're going to move the game to Atlanta or to another city, they can't do that, and here's why they can't do that. Certainly can't go home and home. The amount of revenue that those two schools make over a two-year period is five times as much as they make off of a home game. The ticket prices are higher than they can charge at the home stadiums. They get food and beverage. They pay no rent. And all their fans, 40-something thousand from each team, will say 42 because they always announce 84,000. And not – not really. Uh, we, we can seat about 82,000 in the stadium. But think about that. 42,000 Gator boosters, 42,000 Bulldogs. Where else are they going to go and be able to do that? Oh, yeah, by the way, the Georgia Dome only seats 71,000. So you're going to have to go tell your boosters that the most important game on your schedule every year, Florida and Georgia, will be somewhere else, and you're not going to get tickets. So that's why they're never going anywhere. Now. As John knows, the city could screw that up. If they forget and drop the ball, that can happen. And believe me, after 12 years in the mayor's office, I saw a lot of balls get fumbled there. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, one of the things that we accomplished when I was in the mayor's office is we paved every road in Duval County. So you got a road to walk on. So we're pretty proud of that. Took the tolls off also. Um, so the game is, is the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, but it's more than that. If you grew up in this town, it's certainly more than that because it's a family affair. Uh, when my parents were alive living in Arlington, we used to have 40 people for our house at dinner. They weren't all Bulldogs. Or, there were a number of Gators there. But we would get to see our aunts and our uncles and our cousins, and that would be the first time we would see them and the only time we would see them in a year. They would come down. We would party. We'd have a really good time. We'd go to the game. We'd tailgate party. And the one great thing about those days is if you lost the game, the party was always more important because then you could get to a point where you could forget the game. But there was never any arguments. We never had any fights uh, other than when we had the stadium and people were leaving together. And we would arrest about 120 people in the stadium, which is um, fortunately for the Jaguars about half of what they arrest. Um, but it's just a family affair, and it means so much to families that grew up with those two great universities. Uh, what troubles me the most about those two great universities is it's so dang hard to get into. Uh, my son was fortunate enough to go there. My daughter was supposed to be fortunate enough to go to Florida. They both recently visited Athens and wished they'd have gone to school in Georgia. So two great universities, um, but it's too hard to get into now. So a lot of our kids and our grandkids probably won't get to go to Florida or Georgia, but uh, I'm worried about that ending the tradition of the family affair and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what does it mean to Jacksonville? This is the most important thing. It's great to have all the pageantry and all the color and everything that goes on during this week, wearing orange and blue and red and black, and everybody gets to holler at their friends and go back and forth all the time. 84,000 people, 52,000 of them from out of town, 52,000 of them have to have a place to stay. We got 24,000 hotel rooms in Duval County, 24,000 full hotel rooms, Friday night and Saturday night, 
at triple the normal daily rate. And I saw something the other day that they said uh, it means 700,000 in the city of Jacksonville. If you just run the numbers, that's $15 million spent directly into our economy, which goes through the economy two and a half times before it leaves. So the value of that game to Jacksonville is the biggest weekend in the whole year. Now, some people will talk about the players championship because they're here for four or five days. The players championship is attended by 82% of the people that go to the players championship are from Jacksonville. And that's the difference. The Gator bowl game years ago used to bring in big crowds. Clemson was a regular, uh, Tennessee's a regular, uh, but again, they come in on Friday night and they leave, and we averaged about 22,000 people from out of town for the Gator Bowl game. So you're talking about $15 million directly into our economy. The people that work in the hotels, the restaurants, and the bars, you're talking about people drinking too much, eating too much, and over-tipping. Well, that's all really good, right? We want them to be over-tipped. And here's what they do with that money. They pay their mortgage, they pay their rent, they go and buy services and goods throughout the next week to 10 days with that extra money. So if you don't think that it touches every aspect of our community and every business in our community, you're probably going to be wrong because it had it, that money that those people make during that week are spent. Think about what kind of food and beverage we have to stock in that stadium. Where do we get that food and beverage from? From local purveyors right? Cisco, a number of companies that supply that. A great boon for Budweiser, now that we're starting to sell beer in, in college stadiums, increases the revenue uh, at the stadium. If the city's got to pay the bill, at least the city's making some money back on some of the other things that they can do. So from a financial standpoint, it's really good for the city of Jacksonville. Well, then you get to the point where, okay, what, what is, what's the intangibles of the game? All these people wearing orange and blue and red and black in this room, that's the intangibles of the game. Once a year, we get an opportunity for CBS at 3.30 in the afternoon to have 20 million people turn on the TV for four and a half hours and look at Jacksonville and look at that stadium and look at that crowd. And that's advertising that you cannot buy anywhere for your city. And it's funny because when we were doing economic development at the chamber and I was on one of the committees, we would talk to CEOs that were moving their, their people here and they always ask one question of me. They ask a lot about education. They ask a lot about other things, but one question of me, what are my people going to get to do in Jacksonville in their spare time from a standpoint of sports? And we would say, well, we've got arguably the fifth major golf championship in the country here. We have a Jack, uh, NFL team here in the Jacksonville Jaguars. We have a Gator Bowl game. We have a pretty good double-A baseball team in a brand-new park. And, oh, yeah, by the way, we have this thing called the World's Largest Outdoor Cocktail Party. And they immediately would look at me and go, I want to go. <laughs> and everywhere I would travel all over the country, and they would, somebody would find out I was in college football, working in college football, and uh, that was the first question they asked me, how do I get tickets? Can I go to that game? So it's famous. It's like Texas OU, UCLA, U USC used to be the same way. Uh, it has made Jacksonville um, on the map of college sports. The reason that we even get talked to about the uh, possibility of being in the playoff system is because we have this game here and they know we know how to host it. And when they know we have one sheriff and they know we have one mayor and they can make sure that everything is set up and everything ready to go. I compare it a little bit to what Augusta does with the masters. They literally let their kids out of school masters week, but everybody in that town from the police fire chief all the way down support and work very hard on this game. In the last four or five months, I will tell you that in, in the conference room at the stadium, the sheriff, the under sheriff, the fire chief, the mayor staff have been in a room working on this game that hard for the last four or five weeks. And they deal with the schools in a very professional way. And uh, so we're in, we're in good stead to keep it. We're in good stead to uh, celebrate it this weekend. Um, I think that uh, I said in the rain when Georgia beat Florida, and I think it was 68, 51 to nothing. Uh, and uh, I think it may be a 51 to nothing game again, but at least we won't be in the rain. It's going to be a beautiful day at 72 degrees.
if you get a chance on Friday to go down to the stadium, if you're not going to the game, I would suggest that you just get in the car and just drive down to the stadium and especially go by um, the RV city that the city builds and sets up and just watch the people. I mean, it's the greatest people watching in the world and they're all getting along. And it's just incredible to me having gone to a number of Florida, Florida state games, how well these two fan groups get along because at Florida and Florida state, it's the only place when I go back to Tallahassee, I don't wear orange and blue. LSU is the same way. I never wear anything but white shirts when I go to those games because there's going to be some problems and it can be a 70 year old man like me, or it can be a 20 year old st college student, but over here, it just doesn't seem to be that bad. And we have a whole lot of drinking going on. Uh, I'll stop there. Cause I could rattle on and on. I could, I could tell you how many games I went to. Um, I went when I was three years old to my first game set with the Georgia coaches wives. Uh, my brother was leading a PGA tour tournament in 1977. And he called my father and said, I'm leading the tournament. Come down and watch me on Saturday. Dad said, we'll be there as soon as the game's over. <laughs> and I am now 70 years old and I have seen 67 straight Georgia Florida games. So I think I may hold the record now. If I could live a little bit, a little bit longer, it'd be nice to have a 75th anniversary game for me that I got to oversee with the Gator Bowl to do that with the Georgia Florida game. So I'll stop, stop talking and ask if anybody's got any questions. Rick, what I'll do for the format of our question and answer portion of today's meeting, if I could ask you to stand behind the podium so our uh, members can ask questions for you. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to say a special thanks to our digital producer for today's broadcast, uh, Joe Springer, uh, for putting on today's meeting, even for our Rotarians that are watching us from home. Uh, and also I'd like to acknowledge our members as well, Jerry Kelly from the Downtown Rotary, as well as uh, Charter member Brent Ross for joining us here today as well. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you have a question uh, for Rick Clatlett, if you could please raise your hand and what I can do is I can walk over to you and you can ask your question for Rick, as well as our webcast members can hear your question as well. Bob Hyde has a question, Bob. Rick, what's the projected cost of a new stadium and how will it be financed? Well, that's the problem of how to finance it. Uh, but it approximately 1.3 billion is the, is the cost of a new stadium. Now you can get crazy and they have built some $1.5 billion stadiums. I don't think you need to do that. I think there's some ways to, to keep the cost down to about 1.3. That seems like a lot of money. Um, but with the revenues that come in, um, with the NFL and the two college games and other games that we might be able to get. Um, I think it makes sense for the economy of Jacksonville. It certainly doesn't make sense of trying to make money off the stadium because you're never going to do that. Right. Councilman, that isn't going to happen. Uh, but what you can do is you can have such an economic development driver that without within the community, you can generate enough money to justify that. What's great about this ownership group. And I'm going to tell you, I'm so impressed by this ownership group. Wayne's great and his family gives millions and millions of dollars to charity. But when is the last time you saw an NFL owner say, I want to build this piece of a facility in a city owned facility that the city's going to own and I'm going to pay half. So I would think that you're probably talking about getting him to pay half of the cost. Um, so you're talking about for the cost of the taxpayers, about 700 million. Any other uh, questions for Rick Catlett live in the audience? I see there's a hand up. I'm going to walk over to you right now, sir, so our uh, webcast members can hear your question. John? You mentioned that if the SEC goes to a nine-game schedule, um, they wouldn't be able to play a neutral site any game anymore. Um, what's the logistics behind that or the reason? It's keeping the balance of how many games you have at home versus taking a game to a neutral site. Uh, if you've noticed... Auburn and Alabama have already made that move. Um, it's in the minds of the conference's staffing and putting the schedules together. They have privately told me that's the one thing that they worry about. A nine-game schedule prohibits us from having this game because the SEC loves this game, guys. It is a premier game on national television for the SEC because everybody in there can chant SEC. Rick, you said uh... – this stadium is one of the worst revenue producers. Can you elaborate as to why? Sure. Um, when we built the stadium in uh, 1993, opened it in 95, uh, the NFL team revenue was third highest in the NFL. Today, we're 31st. 
So how does that happen? Well, it happens two ways. One, Jacksonville doesn't have all the major corporations that an Atlanta or a New York has. Uh, but secondly, the premium revenues. So the club areas um, at, our, at our stadium, and I was part of the design to, to make them vertical like this, um, they don't generate the kinds of top end dollars that if you had it go around the, the, the bowl, like in most stadiums, uh, we only have 91 suites. We're going to need 175 to 200 suites for the game. Um, but, but primarily, if you go to the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, there's 19 clubs in that stadium. Some of them are ground level. Some of them are like our terrace suite. Some of them are little small clubs for 50 people at a time. But those are the premium revenues that spin out. If you've tried to go and get a concession in one of our Thursday night games or the Monday night games that the Jaguars have had, you're going to wait in line for a considerable period of time before you can get something to eat or drink and get back into the game. They have set it up now where you don't have those problems at the major stadiums, so more revenue from, from food and beverage is generated. Um, and just the overall tailgating experience down at our stadium, we're all college people mostly before we became NFL fans. You can't uh, – we would go and tailgate. Well, you don't tailgate at NFL games. There's very few places, maybe besides Green Bay, that tailgated NFL games. So by building what they were calling Lot J and the entertainment center that they plan on building down there, they will also have that revenue coming in. The St. Louis Cardinals baseball team is the best – opportunity to ever see what we're talking about uh, i went to the sec basketball tournament when missouri came into the conference and it is a facility that's forty thousand square feet of entertainment pure tailgating entertainment um, we're going to use those parking lots around the stadium you're going to see those all go away eventually because they're going to build stuff around the stadium which gives you an opportunity then to have office space and taxes coming from the office space and and those kinds of things. So those are the premium revenues you're really talking about. Rick, over here in the back row, Judge Wallace has a question he'd like to ask. Yeah, just was to ask you to comment on what, what you see as the future of the Gator Bowl game. Uh, you know, what, what the, its prominence relative to the other bowl games and just uh, what, what do you see as the, the future and what the game will be like going forward? Well, we just – last year was the first game of a six-year deal. Um, the uh, college football playoff organization has said they're not going to start expansion now until the, this six-year period is gone which means three years from now they will have a plan in place to do it you'll know what that plan is uh, my fear is if you take 12 teams and the sec is now going to get four of those teams in probably or five potentially um your 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 quality of teams will be a lot lower there'll be a lot more seven and five teams that'll be available for the selection and I think the Jacksonville fan base is um, not going to not going to accept that. We're already struggling at the box office. When I first took over in '93, '93, my budget was never less than sixty-five thousand tickets sold. My last budget last year was forty thousand tickets sold. Uh, you look at teams that really travel well. Uh, if they've been to a number of bowl games, you know, Bobby Bowden went to what thirty-six straight bowl games. The fan base will only go if it really means something. Are they playing somebody that they want to play? And I think that's the issue. Somebody said the other day, well, you know, the Gator Bowl could get Clemson this year. Well, do you think Clemson's going to travel like Clemson of the past? No, because they've been going to national championship games, right? Uh, they said, well, you could get Florida. Well, that defeats the purpose of the Gator Bowl because we want to fill the hotels up, right? Uh, I mean, the, the, the Gator Bowl was started by 13 business people for one purpose things used to shut down around christmas and new year's and we wanted people to come here and spend their money and that's what it's all about and oh yeah by the way nice exposure for the city and if people really hadn't seen a college football game then then they get to go but think about it now most of us if you're a college football fan you're going to two or three games at your school even in athens right i mean people are going up to athens and watching football games so it's nothing unique um, for a football game anymore but the economic impact is still there, and, and so I hope it continues on. Um, I think it's an asset to Jacksonville, but uh, I don't hold out hope unless we're somehow getting into the playoffs. Rick, with the need for a new stadium, has there been any talk about it? Would, would it be better to leave it open air or to have it closed like um, Jerry World, if you will? 
Well, you know, in the old days, it was talked about that you, you would, you, in the South, you would not put a, a roof on the stadium. Anybody been to a Jaguar game in September? So I think that answers the question, right? Um, if you put a half like they did down in, in Miami, um, remember where our sun is at one o'clock, even with the half roof, that sun is still going to be on that East stands and it's still going to be really hot in there. So I think William, they're going to go to a, a covered roof, probably a retractable that they can open and close. Uh, but as you know, how many Florida Georgia games have we had bad weather that we, we probably needed that. Rick, right over here in the center, Brent Ross has a question. When they redo the stadium, how are they going to do that? Is it going to tear down what they've got and rebuild it in the same spot, or they have another place they're going to put it? How, well, how is that going to go down? With eminent domain, they could they could build it in another spot. But the more they build around it right now, the stadium that's existing, the more it requires them to tear it down and rebuild it. Um, interestingly enough, it took us two years to do this one. I would think that to do a dome stadium, you could probably do it in two and a half years. So maybe we have to miss this game and the, and the Gator Bowl game. And, uh, you know, other teams have – NFL teams have played in other places. So does the Jaguars go down and play in, in uh, Orlando or, um, you know, some of them play in other – I mean, we just had our the, – the Saints come over here and play a game. So um, that's logistical things that can be worked out. But I would think you'd have to think along those lines of, of the stadium being shut down for two years. I'm going to look to uh, Joe Springer if we have any questions that are being submitted via the webcast that we would like to read on the air for Rick to be able to answer for today. By, by the way, one, one real quick statement. How many of you went to the Georgia-Florida game in Athens and the Georgia-Florida game in Gainesville? Did that not – excuse me? Was that not horrible? And, and I mean, you would think – you, you would think I'm a, you know, I'm a Gator. You would think I would have really enjoyed all those Georgia fans leaving Stanford Stadium. But, but I have to tell you, it was, it was just another football game. And that's why it's special when it's at a neutral site. Rick, we have a, a compliment received on your behalf uh, from our member Alton Yates. He says, my friend Rick Catlett is and has been one of Jacksonville's greatest assets, period. Alton Yates. How about a round of applause? Thank on you that. very much. I appreciate it. President Ike, I'm going to uh, go Gators, it, by the way. There you go. Oh, wow. Interesting. President Ike, I'd like to uh, send it back over to you. Uh, what a great presentation today from one of Jacksonville's finest, Rick Catlett. President Ike. Thank you, Rick. Really appreciate you being here today. Appreciate uh, the Riverside Club co hosting with us. I'd like to call Joe Everly up uh, to lead us in the four way test while Joe's making his way up. Uh, remind you that past. Rotary International President John Germ will be our presenter next week. Uh, please RSVP. And um, if you lost your glasses, see me after the meeting. I have them. Okay. If you repeat after me, our four-way test, the things we, things we think, say, and do. First, to the truth. Second, to fair all concern. Third, will and better friendship. And fourth, beneficial of all concern. Thank you, Joe. And our, our quote today and sticking with the football theme is from a uh, longtime Pittsburgh Steelers coach, Chuck Knoll. Good things come to those who hustle. 